Hello and welcome to this Aston Originals podcast uh, from uh, Aston History, the History Department at Aston University. My name is Brian Sudlow. I'm a lecturer in uh, history. And uh, this, in fact, is uh, a sort of special production, really, in conjunction with the Birmingham and Midlands Institute, because on Monday 13th of March, uh, they will be hosting... Uh, the author Andrew Heavens, who's coming to Birmingham to talk about his new book, uh, The Prince and the Plunder, How Britain Took One Small Boy and Hundreds of Treasures from Ethiopia. And uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Andrew here onto the podcast. Andrew, thank you very much for joining us. Hi, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, um, Andrew, first of all, congratulations on the on the book. Um, and um, I think uh, uh, I can definitely say this is a uh, a real triumph and a, and a very special um, history essay. It's a, it's a vast story. It's a complex story, but uh, you managed to relate that 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 story with a very very light touch. Um, so uh, it's uh, it's it's quite an achievement. Is this your first book? It's my first book. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a journalist, but this is the longest I've ever written in in one go. So yes, yeah. Okay. Well, um, I, I think you've done. I think you've done a, a, a splendid, uh, a splendid job. And um, I think probably the first thing we ought to do is um, tell uh, tell people exactly what the what the what the book is about. So, who is the prince? What is the plunder? Uh, and what's this story that you tell? Right. Well, it, I mean, it's it's about a boy, um, a young prince, who spent the first uh, third of his life on living on top of a mountain, on top of a mountain, in the stunning highlands of Ethiopia. And then because of a disastrous breakdown in Ethiopian-British relations in the, in the run-up to the scramble for Africa, um, British troops charged in uh, to free some Europeans that the, his father had imprisoned. Um, they defeated his father in a massive battle. And as troops did in those days, they um, raised his mountain fortress, took piles and piles of plunder, illuminated manuscripts, gold crowns. And along with all that, they also picked up this little six-year-old, about to be seven-year-old boy, um, took him out of the country, down from the highlands, um, up the Red Sea, and plonked him in Britain um, in 1868. And really, it's a story, it's, it's kind of part treasure hunt, where I try to track down all the various bits of treasure that came back with the British forces. And I use those individual bits of treasure to try and tell the story of Prince Alamayu. Um, you, know, you know, he's a young boy, he didn't leave huge piles of memoirs and letters behind him. But one way that you can tell someone's story is through other people's accounts and through the physical objects that are still all around us, even though we've willfully or not willfully um, forgotten this story. It's it never never got it into our school textbooks. So that I mean that's the essence of it. It, it focuses on the boy and follows him through the plunder. And um, uh, it's 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 a many layered story, isn't it? And I think one of the things I was I was most struck by is that. Um, uh, on on one level, this is this is a, this is a story about about global history, um, and about the reach of uh, of 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 Britain and uh, of uh, of the British Empire uh, there in the in the in, in the middle of the nineteenth century and towards the end of the nineteenth century, but it's also a story about um, uh, about this this kingdom, which was at a very Different stage of its uh, development, um, uh, a very different political, cultural, and social model, um, but at the same time, um, uh, very deep historical roots as 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 well. Um, and uh, I, I wonder if you could just sort of speak to that a little bit. Absolutely, I could I could say how Britain saw Ethiopia because again, this was. As I said before, in the run-up to the scramble for Africa, we hadn't charged in there and started carving up a continent into little squares for for property. Really, Britain and the other imperial, imperial powers were nibbling at the edges of Africa. And for them, the interior was one big blank, which they filled with all sorts of fantasies and um, imaginings. And in Ethiopia, obviously, we're, we're filled with the characters like Prester John, you know, the great priest, Christian king that people imagined all over the world. Um, imaginary characters like Rasselas, and then the whole concept of uh, King Solomon. Um, you know, all the emperors of Ethiopia traced their heritage back to King Solomon. So that also filled Britain with um, 
all sorts of imaginings of riches, King Solomon's mines, that kind of thing. Ethiopia, on the other hand, was had been through a period of chaos, um, uh, sort of puppet uh, prin uh, um, uh, puppet prin princes vying to keep control of the emperors, until this hugely um, energetic, hugely compelling man arrived on the scene. Um, Kassa was his original name, um, originally some kind of bandit stroke uh, militia leader who grew to become, who took on the crown of emperor of King of Kings of Ethiopia and forcibly united it. And from his point of view, he was a great Christian ruler who was seeking the world for his equals, the other great Christian rulers of the world. And among those was Queen Victoria, Napoleon, all the people that he hoped would help him um, form a great alliance. And he had grand dreams of re retaking Jerusalem, um, taking on the Ottoman Empire in the same way that, you know, all great powers did at that time. So in many ways, it was a, initially a great meeting of minds. You know, he met these British adventurers coming in from the coast, looking for advancement, opportunities, treaties. Um, but because of a really quite absurd chain of events involving him sending a letter to Queen Victoria and the great British bureaucracy losing that letter and um, never getting around to uh, returning it, leaving him furious and offended and paranoid, um, that relationship broke down. But it's a compelling moment because it, it, this whole story is full of what ifs. What if England and uh, Britain and Ethiopia had forged a an alliance? What would we have seen the same carve up um, of Africa? There are so many things that we will never know because everything collapsed into disaster, into this battle, and into a quick smash and grab raid by Britain, taking coming in, freeing captives, taking the treasure and this little boy, and essentially scurrying back to London. I, I do want to get onto the story of uh, uh, Amalayu um, in a, in a moment, but I, I just want to ask you about the um, the significance of this story. Um, you know, at the moment, um, uh, just in passing, let me mention there are so many details in the in in, in the book, the wonderful uh, vignettes and, and and little allusions here and there. Uh, just for for people from Birmingham, the Midlands, they you know might be interested to know. Um, to, in Sir Wadrus's treasury, are uh, um, there's there's pottery from Staffordshire. Um, there's also carpets from Kidderminster as well. which put a smile on my face. So there's there's. <laughs> well, it's a real, it's that hasn't struck me, but of course, yes, yeah. Yes, there's a real international treasury, and there are lots of other things from from Paris and Berlin and and and, and, and Moscow and, and and so on. Um, but let me bring you back to this issue of, of significance. You know, why why is it important to tell? This story about Amalayu and 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 the fall of his father and and what happens to Amalayu afterwards. Uh, why is well, it we're going that story now? Right, well, we're we're going through such an interesting time at the moment in Britain. At the moment, I mean, let's just focus on statues. You know, we've been through a period where lots of statues have been coming down across Britain, and, and it, whatever you think about that, that is a real engagement in history. People are looking at the the figureheads around us and taking trying to take down the ones that divide us. Uh, which in simplistic terms leaves us with leaves us with lots of empty plinths um and who do we put up in the in place of the, these statues and, and it's not just a practical question of replacing statues it's, it's a question of who do we look up to who do we look to who do we find out about now that we're reassessing everything about our history and learning things that we didn't know before and there are so many grown-up reasons to be interested in this story you know you, and uh, no doubt things that can be studied like you know the status of uh britain's empire its its treatment of children its treatment of race those are crucial questions which i think the book um edges into what i really hope that people come away from this book is is a more personal reaction the sort of a, a falling for alamayu in the same way that i fell for alamayu and seeing him as a figure that unites us um a, a figure that i believe should go up on a lot of these empty plinths across britain you know, he spent the first third of his life in Ethiopia. He spent the last two thirds of his life outside Ethiopia, mostly in Britain. So for good or ill, he is Anglo-Ethiopian. He's an Anglo-Ethiopian figure that unites us and is someone that we deserve to, we, that we need to find out more about. And I think that's why it's a significant story to look at, because it moves us on from a kind of a, a cleansing fire of tearing down the statues to thinking about who we look to in their, in their place. That's what I hope anyway. Yeah, understood. And 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 I mean, Amalaya's story is is um, 
uh, it, it's difficult and it's it's uh, complex. He ends up back in England. His father had wanted the English to look after him, uh, hadn't he? And um, uh, but then Amalayu is um, uh, in the custody of a, a Captain Speedy, uh, who was one of the well, again one of the interesting characters characters in the book, and that he's passed between other other tutors. Um, uh, can we just dwell for a second on on this extraordinary cast of of characters that are in the in the book and who stand behind Am- Amalayu in a way? Um, uh, I mean, do you have a favourite character from the book? Well, I mean, I'm going to have to say it's Prince Alamayu, who is my is my favourite character. I, and um, what I found quite interesting is that um, you know, in, in, in most stories, it's it's good to have goodies and baddies, as in you know, it simplifies things. You can sort of uh, simplifies the narrative. I found it very difficult to hate anyone in this story. I found big hairy question marks coming up over motivations and that kind of thing. But this is a complex human story which doesn't have goodies and baddies. As, as in our lives rarely have goodies and baddies. Um, so I, I really grew to at least understand or find things fascinating with everyone involved. And it's really the cast of characters that Alamayu passes through. Um, there, there's so many questions. There's so many questions about how he came to be in Britain. Uh, a lot, lots of people I've heard in Ethiopia say he was kidnapped, he was stolen, he was abducted. Um, lots of people in Britain say, no, 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 we rescued him. We rescued him from his father's enemies who were circling the, the mountain. Um, you know, we, this was a, a, a charitable gesture to bring him to Britain and put him through some of the best boarding schools, although that's a, <laughs> that's a, um, a mixed blessing, uh, taking a small boy through boarding school. Um, but obviously, neither of these you know, extremes are true. The, the characters that um, came through and came in touch with Alamayu from uh, Captain Speedy, the best named person in in, in history, I think. Um, Queen Victoria fell for Alamayu the moment she met him. She fell in love with the kind of the romantic picture of this little boy and um, the giant uh, uh, guardian by his side, Captain Speedy. Um, uh, he met Darwin. He met Tennyson on the Isle of Wight. Um, he came back and... Um, when, when the government wrenched him from the hands of Captain Speedy, who was too chaotic a guardian, he went into the guardianship of uh, William Jex Blake, who was the headmaster of Cheltenham College and then Rugby School, um, who had nine daughters. Uh, Queen Victoria worried that Alamayu would have a tough time playing with girls, but these were amazing girls. The, uh, the, the, the girls of the Jex Blake family were the ones that gave it its edge. You know, They went on to become proto-suffragettes and early uh, some of the first women to be qualified as doctors. So Alamayu the, 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 the constant cast of characters that Alamai lived with, and not least himself, and a, a compelling character as a young boy, really are what held the story together. Um, you know, never forgetting that at the heart of this, there's a little boy who had been through the trauma of war, had been through the trauma of losing both his parents and of having his universe ripped up um, and then dragged to this, what must have seemed a very bizarre country. So I'm afraid at the end of it, I struggled to find goodies and baddies. I just found a very complex and compelling cast of characters and one i can't get out of my head which is the little boy himself who um and the young man that he he grew into alamayu and uh, it's probably worth um uh, underlining isn't it that uh i mean the the, the story is invigorating it's 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 enthralling really um uh, moving moving from 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 one side of africa all you know all the way over to to um uh, to england um but at the same time, as you as you as you say, there is a there's a tragedy in Am- uh, Amalayu's uh, life. Uh, he loses his father, who commits suicide at the end of the siege. Uh, he loses his mother within is it a month? It's uh, awful. Yeah, it's not clear. It's not clear exactly why. Um, presumably, around this time, he's separated from servants and and, and other figures that he would have known, and. Um, uh, later on, particularly when you narrate um, how, how how poorly he did uh, at rugby, and 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 then the disaster of going to Sandhurst, where he failed everything yep. several times over, um, uh, one really gets the sense of 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 there's something broken inside him. Um, you speculate on whether um, uh, he could have been dyslexic, and perhaps he was, but perhaps he was also just someone who was just lost, uh, kind of lost his motivation in. In life, and there was no, there was no contact, or, or hardly any contact, back with Ethiopia, was there? That's right. That's right. I, I, I don't want to get the idea that you know he was a, 
a, a passive victim because mm. what one thing I, I loved about him was as far as I could tell, remember we're talking about a young boy who again didn't leave a verbatim account of his life. But as far as I can tell, he faced these constant challenges, the traumas that you just narrated there. Um, and traumas don't just, you don't just get over them. Traumas stick with you. Traumas, you know, break you inside. But he, for the, at least for the, for the bulk of his life, he seemed to face all these challenges with a real energy and a real will. And um, he did his best. And, uh, you know, the, I mean, it's, it's silly things like the, the, the sports reports from the schools he went to are constantly referring to the fact that he, he didn't get a, he didn't get a century in the cricket match, but he was the one that tried the hardest or he came in fifth in the steeplechase. You know, it's this kind of boy's own will that kept him going. And as far as I can tell, he charmed everyone he met, everyone who met him, despite the, you know, the, the racial um, uh, prejudice of the time, obviously of our time as well, not giving us an out. Um, you can get the feeling that time and time again, he won people over, he charmed them until, as, as I can read it, the challenge just got too much. You know, he was, he was, um, constantly looked at he was you know the only black boy in his school the only black boy in the in the region um he, he must have felt so under the microscope so alone um when it came to his prospects you know he wasn't academic for whatever reason the instinct was to shove him into the army but you know the, the british army wouldn't have a um a, 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 an officer of african descent commanding white troops so constantly there was this barriers put up against him like I, and i speculate that what must have been a grinding sense of failure and frustration. If let's say he was dyslexic, you know, we hear from people who are dyslexic that it's a, it's it's a tough thing to go through, you know, especially if it's not recognised. Um, he he faced at the end of the Sandhurst, where, as far as I can tell, he felt he faced merciless bullying, and then a sense of directionless, and a last wish to go home, but the government said that was impossible; he'd never be able to go home. These must have combined to weaken his his spirits weaken his body and when he um in this tragic end um develops an infection um it, staying with his tutor outside leeds um the, i mean the, the feeling i get is that finally i mean there's this phrase you know people turn themselves to the wall don't they and um in a way a, bo a mind can make a body give up i mean again this, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid this is not a historian talk this is speculation on top of speculation but in a way you have to try and fill in the gaps to try and work out what happened. Well, I, I think that's I think that's right. You have to you you do have to fill in the, the gaps. Um, one of the uh, one of the challenges for history is that we'll we'll never have all the data we really would have wanted. We'll never have all the sources we really would have wanted. Um, yeah. And uh, but I think the story that you tell is is uh, about Amalayu is 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 very is very convincing. Um, uh, there is one interesting twist of uh, uh, just at the at the end, isn't there? In connection to General Gordon, but I think maybe we'll 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 leave that little hook there for anyone who watches the podcast, uh, and perhaps you can uh, relate that uh, that that part of the story uh, once you're in uh, um, at the Birmingham Midlands Institute and, and uh, uh, taking taking questions. Um, I I think uh, uh, we'll draw things to a to to a close here. Hopefully, for uh, anyone watching, uh, this will. Uh, would have given them a, a flavour about uh, um, uh, concerning what this what, what what this book is about, um, and uh, giving them a sense as well of of uh, uh, really what what a what a tremendous what a tremendous work uh, it is as well. It's it, it's been a uh, a very entertaining read, a very a very thoughtful read as well. And as you can see there on the on the screen, um, uh, you've had uh, um, lots of lots of good reviews. Um, and, um, uh, you know, obviously I'll, I'll uh, uh, just let me wind up by saying I wish you well for, uh, you know, with the, with the book and is, is the next book in progress? I've got a couple in mind. Yes. One related one, totally unrelated. So let, let, let's see where that goes, but that's very kind of you. Thanks very much. It's been, it's been wonderful to talk. Good. Andrew, thank you ever so much for your time. And we look forward to seeing you on the 13th of March in Birmingham. Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Looking forward to it. Thanks a lot.